Welcome to Energy Stew. This is Peter Roth, your host. And we're going on a journey with a fascinating author, um, teacher, student, whatever. Uh, he's, a, he's a man who has experienced <laughs> a lot in his life and on all levels of reality, including um, a fascination with people who have had near-death experiences. Um, he was a, a pediatrician at a, uh, a pediatric hospital, and and uh, there were kids having near-death experiences. So there's a lot to talk about uh, with our fascinating guest. He's been on the show a number of times before. I'm so glad to have him back, Melvin Morse. Melvin, welcome. Thank you so much, Peter. It is such a joy to be on your program. We can talk about things on your program that, you know, I, I've been on Oprah, I've been on Larry King, I've been on Coast to Coast, and I can tell you I've never had more interesting conversations than we've had. It's just, I think that uh, you are really on the cutting edge of spirituality. Now, if we can only get 10 million people to hear you say that, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I really, I really am honored by that. So uh, you've had a, a lot of struggles in your life that changed you. Originally, you were, or at least you, Absolutely. you write about having been too caught up in your ego and materialism, and, and you were a doctor who, um, I guess you might call, you were arrogant about who you were and what you were doing. And um, you ended up getting absolutely, yeah. And you ended up getting getting caught. <laughs> the universe said you're flying too high. You've had uh, you you've you you know it, it's it's wonderful because uh, you know they say that uh, both fame and failure are the same. And I've experienced fame and I've experienced failure. And it's funny, uh, one of, the, uh, one of the, the manuals, as I call it, uh, is written in the, uh, oh, I think about the uh, 13th century by a Tibetan monk. It's called the 37 Verses on How to Be uh, a Compassionate Person. And he says in there uh, that you have to regard fame and failure, you have to see them as both teaching you as your teachers sure. and that your, your sense of reputation is like, this is a Tibetan master saying it's like blowing snot out your nose, <laughs> but I'll just give you a thumbnail sketch, Peter, of what happened with me. Sure. Um, I was a pediatrician um, at the university of Washington, studied near death experiences in children and did this work when I was in my early thirties. At the same time, I was uh, honored as a pediatrician. I uh, received uh, what they call uh, uh, the best doctor uh, award uh, for American pediatricians. Um, you know, it just seemed like anything I did was golden. I wrote a book, it became an international bestseller. Um, I, you know, I had a thriving pediatric practice. Uh, it, I was honored as being one of America's best pediatricians and um, I got full of myself. You know, it, uh, under, it, this all happened at a fairly young age and I just really had the idea uh, that, um, that my ego, uh, that I could do anything that, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, and it's ironic because what I was learning, I was studying the near death experiences of children. And what these children were telling me, these children who, you know, have been to the point of death, have died, many of them, and then resuscitated. And I can tell you this, Peter, because by and large, these are children that either I or my uh, medical team resuscitated from death. So, so I don't have to rely on, you know, some reading someone else's medical charts or hearing some sort of a story. Uh, these are experiences uh, that I directly um, witnessed. Uh, as an example, um, this young boy uh, came over to Seattle Children's Hospital 
and uh, he had a full-blown cardiac arrest uh, in the uh, lobby waiting room. And we resuscitated him right there. As a, you know, we didn't have time to take him to the emergency room even. And after we successfully resuscitated him, he looked at me and he opened his eyes and looked at me and he said, that was weird. You guys just sucked me back into my body. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when you hear something like that, you know that, you know, you, you know that it's true. You know that it's real. But the message that these children were telling me is that we're here for a reason. And that is that th this, this reality is a school and we're here to learn lessons of love. And I can tell you that uh, I lectured on this and I told people this and I explained to them and I felt uh, that I was, you know, just so filled with wisdom and helping grieving parents and all of this. And yet in my personal life, uh, things were really deteriorating and I did not learn my lessons of love. And to, to make a long story short, um, made created, you know, I did this myself. I created a very toxic, ugly environment in my personal life. And this resulted uh, in uh, my stepdaughter uh, making uh, false accusations against me. And, and these accusations, Yes, uh, these accusations resulted uh, in uh, my being convicted uh, of uh, child endangerment. Uh, it was very dramatic. It was like headlines all over the country. A pediatrician waterboards uh, his uh, stepdaughter. Um, at first, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe that people really took that seriously because oddly enough, I was never accused of waterboarding her, but was convicted uh, and spent two years in prison and went through that experience of feeling that I'd lost everything. Lost my family, lost my reputation, my license to practice medicine, all of these things um, that, that I really, you know, this is who I thought I was. And yet I discovered something even more than that. I, I discovered a relationship that I finally developed with this, this God for, well, that's what kids call it. So I'm going to call it God because uh, virtually all the children that uh, I resuscitated told me uh, that they saw God, you know, that, uh, you know, not a higher power, not a, you know, all the different names that we have for God. Um, and I learned uh, my lessons of love. I learned them in prison. I was humbled. I, my ego destroyed uh, and in fact, um, learned uh, astonishing lessons of love. And I couldn't have loved, learned them any other way, Peter. I, I really couldn't. Right. When I look at the flow of my life, I don't could have learned any other way. And the people you met in prison were a big part of your growth. Right? <laughs> who, who knew? Who knew, Peter, that you would find uh, with, you know, uh, people who had committed murder, uh, carjackers, mostly drug addicts. Let's face it. You know, the sad reality is that most of the people in prison are uh, heroin or methamphetamine addicts who had to steal uh, or otherwise commit crimes to support their habits. That's the sad reality. I mean, what, it, you know, I, I know that uh, you know, prior to my going to prison, uh, I think I felt like everybody else, you know, oh my God, you know, don't let those people out of prison. Uh, you know, the public won't be safe and there's going to be rapists uh, roaming the streets. Uh, that's actually not the case. Uh, I would say uh, easily 70 to 80 percent of the people uh, in prison uh, are uh, addicted to drugs, uh, alcohol, heroin, uh, methamphetamine, and are not being treated. Right. Uh, but uh, having said that, who knew? That these people would teach me spiritual lessons and uh, and the near-death experiences I heard from them are, are unlike any near-death experience I've ever heard and yet were more compelling and more uh, convincing and, and more humbling um, than, than really <laughs> You, you know, most of these, let, let's face it, I've lectured, as you know, Peter, you know, with your radio program, the people on your show, it's mostly new age, it's mostly white, upper middle class or middle class audiences. 
um, and people who don't have particularly um, challenging spiritual problems. It's very different when you hear these types of near-death experiences and spiritual uh, awakenings uh, in men uh, who have uh, committed very serious crimes. Right, and well, and, I want to uh, know uh, that, that, I'll, I'll just that, tell you the one that, that Okay, please. Um, well, I, I just, it, I'll just tell you one that, that humbled me that, uh, tremendously is uh, this um, uh, a young man named Jamal. And from the inner city of uh, the city of Wilmington, the murder capital in the United States, uh, told me he had been hustling and dealing drugs since he was 12. Um, really, uh, you know, had never been, uh, you know, employed uh, uh, virtually uh, his entire life uh, when he wasn't in prison uh, carrying a gun. And um, this is it's funny how it came up. Uh, I was at a, a class with him that we take uh, before uh, release from prison in which you have to talk about your plan, your plan for, you know, how, what you're going to do after a prison. So he got up and he said, uh, well, God already told me my plan. And uh, you know, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, and he said, yeah. He's, and then he told me in, in the class of his near-death experience. And he had never even heard of a near-death experience before. I asked him, had he, you know, did he know about these experiences? He said, you know, he said, listen, Doc, all I read is hood books. <laughs> I, you know, I, I dropped out of school in eighth grade. I, I don't even, you know, I didn't know there was a term, a near-death experience. And yet, uh, he nearly died when he was in prison uh, during this recent incarceration. Uh, he said that uh, he uh, floated out of his body. He saw people working on his body below him. He said he was in a room that was completely white. And then he said that God held him in his hand and told him that he had a plan for him. And he looked at me, Peter, and he goes, me? You know, who am I? And yet God said that, that even I have a plan. And uh, he didn't know what the plan was, but he did know that this plan involved uh, after he was uh, released to not come back to prison again. And I was very skeptical of this. Uh, he told me everything had changed for him, that he was transformed. And I was like, Jamal, you know, you're a drug dealer and you've just as much admitted that when you go back to the streets, you're gonna deal drugs again. And he said, you know, doc, that's all I know is dealing drugs. So I don't know, you know, I can't tell you what I'm going to do, but I do know um, uh, he got rid of all his girlfriends. Um, the, the language, you know, I, I can't use the language uh, that uh, he uses on your show, but uh, got rid of all his uh, girlfriends, uh, was running women for prostitution from prison, uh, got rid of all of that. Um, uh, went to school, got a GED, and then that wasn't even enough for him. He went back and took classes and actually got a high school, uh, you know, a diploma. Um, got involved with a woman uh, who was a nurse and told me, Doc, my life has changed. And I had to understand that it challenged my own ideas of what is a transformation. You know, I, you know, we, we have our all ideas and, and yet I had to look at his life for what it was and realize that each one of us is learning our own individual lessons and that the transformation in his life may not be a transformation that I can understand. And yet, um, clearly, if you could see his face light up when he said, me, I didn't even know there was a God. And yet, he's got a plan for me. But and so, that, to me, that says God has a plan for every single one. Right. And I certainly believe that we're all here living through patterns that we've chosen before we were born to fulfill in this, in this life, including the hardships that we are facing, um, the difficulties, certainly, you know, we're, the, the road you've been on, I'm certain was it's called preordained 
and you just didn't know about it because you're here to well, do the great work you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I, I, I really Peter, this that. experience of mine has taught me that. Sure. Of course. Now, I just want to go back to... You know, there's no sense in me getting angry. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Peter. But I, I wanted to just say, I, I want to build on what you're saying. There's no sense in me getting angry uh, at uh, what happened to me. Uh, the prosecutor, the judge. I know we got together before this. You're going to be the prosecutor who you know falsely accuses you, and you're going to be the judge, and you're going to be the victim, and you're going to be the you know. And, and we all play this role. And when I saw the men in prison and listened to the stories of their lives, their lives made the most sense if you understood that they were learning specific lessons of love. Right. And that's not what I thought being a criminal was all about. And yet, absolutely, there's a, just time and time again that their crimes involved them struggling with issues of love. Well, I think the whole purpose of life is to come to this planet of struggle Everybody faces struggle. Buddha said, life is all of suffering. And we come here to find the light with, amidst the struggle. And we, we, don't, that's not, we don't have to call it light. Yeah. We come here to, to fix things, to make it better, to help ourselves, to help others. In each way, we're seeking more light for the, of that. And... Um, and for some people, it's more successful than others. I think we're at an age where more and more people are going to find this sense of, of unconditional love, of, of uh, unity, and um, compassion, and empathy. We're moving more and more towards that. And, uh, but I, the idea of working from a prison experience, I. Many years ago, I actually volunteered at a maximum security prison for a while. I, I would drive there, it was about an hour and a half away. I'd drive there and then I'd speak to groups of prisoners, sometimes uh, an auditorium full of them, uh, about health and fitness and you know, taking care of ourselves properly, uh, lifestyle. And and I'd put them through meditations and all kinds of interesting things. But I found them, it was a maximum security prison, and I found them, so many people there were just the nicest guys. You know, they really uh, were, were super interested, super helpful, uh, looked like they got along with each other very well. And yet I was only seeing more of a superficial part of it because I wasn't living there, I was only visiting. And uh, I really got to see the humanity of these people. I, I never knew what they were there for. It wasn't you know, part of the conversation. Um, but I'm sure there were some ugly stories. But these were people who had you know, found some humanity themselves to act very uh, human and uh, in a good way. Uh, so that yeah, was... That, that's that's the most surprising thing. That's the most surprising thing I learned as well, Peter. Right. And I, I just, I want to emphasize what you said is so true that uh, I'll tell you something my attorney said. He's uh, the top criminal defense attorney in Delaware. And he said, realistically, it's 45 seconds out of these people's lives that changes their lives forever. And, you know, so the, the by and large, you know, our idea uh, that, that, that these men are sociopaths, or at least my idea that they're sociopaths or criminal personalities was wrong. And I'll, I'll tell you who told me this. Um, the, the best way is um, I asked the prison guards. I said to them, of the men who are, because who knows better than them? I said to them, of the men who are here, what percent do you think really need to be here? 
And again and again, even from the most jaded uh, you know, um, correctional officers, they would say, you know, maybe 10%. It said the rest are really no different than the rest of us. And, you know, they, they made some bad they, choices. They'd say it in a funny way. They'd say, you know, the they, were in the wrong, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, made some right. choices, and all of a sudden they were in, in trouble over their heads. But the, you know, who knows better than them? They live with these men day in and day out for year after year, and they were emphatic about it. That right. only 10% of the people there were fundamentally different from the rest of society. Wow. And uh, that uh, these are, by and large, 45 seconds changes your life. Uh, what you know, when you say the bar, 45 seconds, uh, what does that you know, relate to? Uh, well, you know, one thing that came to a big surprise to me is that most people in the inner city carry weapons wherever they go. Um, most of these, some of these young men are, you know, they're as bright as any medical student I ever taught. They're, 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 they're decent, hardworking guys, but they just believe, uh, probably rightly so, uh, you know, it's an environment I don't know anything about, but that they can't leave their house unless they have a gun. Well, if people are carrying guns around all the time, um, there's going to be, you know, you're going to get angry. You're going to make a stupid mistake. You're going to uh, shoot somebody with, with that gun. And that might be the space typically of, of 45 seconds. Okay. Uh, from beginning to end. Right. Uh, you, know, you know, that's, that's a, a realistic. Um, that that's the 45 seconds that changes your life. Right. And, uh, but the rest of your life, oddly enough, um, uh, really, there is no difference between most of the young men I met and the smartest uh, medical students that I work with. Uh, they they want they uh, they want to live a good life. Nobody wants to spend their time in prison. One of the most uh, touching things when I was there was the men said to me, "Teach me how to think differently," because even the most fundamental spiritual truths, such as um, you don't have to get someone before they get you. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a, uh, a spiritual understanding that, that most of the men I met um, believe. And it came as a tremendous shock to them to realize, hey, wait a minute, I can choose to react differently. And your work with meditation, I'm sure, Peter, that those men just soaked that up because uh, the men came to me and wanted to learn meditation. And I learned how to meditate uh, from uh, some of the people that uh, society, uh, you know, has discarded. And yet some of them are the most um, spiritually aware and uh, connected people that you can imagine. Sure. And I have, these are the men that we're locking up. I have two close friends, a uh, husband and wife, who many years ago, they were very successful international marketers, uh, had a big business. And... One morning he woke up and said, I'm giving up everything. I'm going to become a humble uh, servant of others. And, and he quit. <laughs> and, and his wife said, what are we doing? I'm, I don't know about this. And then he uh, went to uh, divinity school, uh, became a, a minister, and started working in prisons and uh, developed a, a huge world around him in prison of people who he helped find their way. And now the two of them in separate prisons, he, he in a men's prison, she in a woman's prison, uh, run theater groups. They teach, they create theatrical productions with the prisoners and it's really uh, helping them grow a lot. But they, it was interesting how he became a you know a capitalist and all of a sudden he was a man of god <laughs> and ne and it never went back yeah. Yeah. yeah beautiful so uh there's a lot of transformation i think that people are recognizing and even might want to know more about what to do with and so it's great for them to hear you know these understandings of reality that you know we can help people there is hope to help people find their light and absolutely right. the transformations that i saw 
were astonishing. Now, do, how much time do we have left, Peter? Only did, a couple did, did minutes. Do we have time for a quick story? I, we just have about two minutes left. Okay. I'm, I'm going to tell you real quickly then, um, this illustrating how we're here to learn lessons of love. Uh, one of my uh, friends in prison uh, prayed and prayed and prayed uh, that he uh, would have a successful uh, modification of his sentence. And um, he was taken to court and given every bit of hope that he could have that uh, done. And he felt strongly that this was the answer to his prayers. And uh, it didn't happen. Uh, and it didn't happen in a very dismissive way. They were just like, what are you doing here? You're, you're not getting your sentence in that far. And so I said to him, Peter, I said, well, what does this mean? What do you think, uh, you know, about God? And, and does this answer your prayers? And he just looked at me and he said, I love Jesus. So this has nothing, you know, it didn't shake his faith at all. And I thought to myself, wow, that was his whole life was to, to have his faith tested like that. What better way could there be if we're here to learn that particular lesson of faith than this man who had, you know, believed strongly that he was going to have his prayers answered, his hopes dashed, and yet still believed? Well, Just there's so much that the you and I. Story. Yeah, there's so much that you and I can talk about, uh, and we're going to continue our conversations. Um, Absolutely. I want to talk about meditation. Uh, all right. Well, also, but let's, I, want hear, I also want to hear about uh, the NDE, NDE experiences of people, of fascinating people that you've met. And uh, you have so much Absolutely. to tell us about. So, um, Melvin Morris, is there a website or, um, or give us a book title? Uh, my website is Melvin Morse MD, um, uh, you know, dot com. Okay. And I've got another one is just uh, Melvin Morse.net. Great. And, and people can uh, see your books there and their videos, all kinds of good stuff. Right. Great. M E L V I N M O R S E, like Morse code. Right. Thanks so much, Melvin. People want to hear about uh, the criminal aspects. Uh, you know, and uh, what happened, that's melvinmorse.net. My son wrote that uh, to try, uh, you know, to let the people know. Um, he strongly supported me and was outraged at what happened to me. Right. And Melvin Morse, uh, MD, is about the spiritual side. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Melvin, for being on Energy Stew. We'll see you soon Thank again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. I can't wait till we talk again. Great. And this is Peter Roth, your host of Energy Stew at PRN.FM. I can be reached at Peter at Heart River, H-E-A-R-T, river.org. I'd love to hear from you, and thanks so much for listening.